All right. Uh, welcome to Adventures Among Ideas. On a previous episode, I talked about the Swiss linguist Ferdinand de Saussure, or at least about a book published published under his name, known in English as the Course in General Linguistics. Today, I want to look at a related scholar who was inspired in part by Saussure, and whom I also admire very much. This is the English linguist, Sir Alan Henderson Gardner. So, uh, Alan Gardner, basically. Uh, but he has a fancier name than that. Gardner was and is probably best known as an Egyptologist. This is why he's most famous. Uh, he studied ancient Egyptian language and culture and was one of the most important Egyptologists of his era. But he also wrote some important books and articles on language in general. His major work in this area is called The Theory of Speech and Language, which was published in 1932 and it had a second edition in 1951, which is basically the same, but he adds some uh, sections kind of uh, uh, discussing his uh, second thoughts and so on. Uh, so, so as I said, uh, Saussure's work had some influence on Gardner, but a more profound influence was the German linguist Philipp Wegener, and Gardner's book is dedicated to Wegener, actually. So I may discuss Wegener in, uh, in the future. Um, I do like his work also, and I have his book. But there's also an, an, ep an episode of another podcast called The History and Philosophy of the Language Sciences on Wegener. So I guess you could listen to that if you're interested in German, the German version, uh, I don't know, the Germanic version of this. Uh, so let's see. I'll also point out that... Um, Gardner's work is pretty similar to Grace de Laguna's, which appeared around the same time. De Laguna and Gardner were both of the same generation, born about a year apart. And Gardner does cite De Laguna's book on speech. He wrote a book on speech. Uh, he cites that once or twice in his own book. Also, if you're familiar with John L. Austin's much more famous writings on language, you might notice some similarities between his work and Gardner's. Actually, there's so many similarities that I uh, sometimes wonder if Austin, who was a bit younger, uh, kind of a gener maybe a generation younger than uh, Gardner, had read Gardner's writings. But in these situations, sometimes it's just because uh, people are working in kind of similar contexts and they end up with similar ideas. Gardner and Austin were both English, by the way. Uh, so let's see. Uh, today I want to look at some of the same topics I explored in my episode on Saussure. So I'll talk about language in relation to speech, and I'll talk about the proper units of language and speech. So let's try to state things clearly right at the beginning. For Gardner, speech is a practical activity, the function of which is to influence someone in reference to something. So, for example, I may want you to take a walk with me or admire me or admire something or pass me the salt or help me with some task, etc., etc. Uh, when I talk to you, I may want you to do one of these things with me or with some other thing in the world, like salt. I may want you to do something with an object or I may want you to do something with me, whatever. In any act of speech, Gardner tells us there are four four factors involved. There's the speaker, the listener, the words, and the things, okay? So speaker, listener, words, and things. The meaning of speaker and listener should be pretty obvious. Those are people, generally, I guess. Uh, he doesn't really talk about um, people talking to dogs, but he does talk a little bit about animal communication, but that's not his main topic here. So speaker and listener, I think you can figure that out, but I'll have something to say about them. Um, but I'll say more about the others, which might be uh, less um easy to understand right on the right at the beginning because he uses these in special ways and the whole topic of uh linguistics is uh what are words anyway or part of linguistics and philosophy of language and so on it's a very tricky topic so anyway but speech speech is a practical activity language but what is language language on the other hand is not it's a uh, it's not an activity but it's a system of knowledge. And Gardner sometimes refers to the science of language. Uh, but here he's using science, I think, in its older meaning as a kind of systematic or organized knowledge, not as something necessarily involving experiment and uh, evidence and proof and verification and stuff like that. Uh, so for Gardner, language is, as he says, all those items of knowledge which enable a speaker to make effective use of word signs. So words are units of language. 
right? So words are on the side of language, but also a part of language are the rules for combining words, syntactic rules, syntax, and also um, the patterns of intonation that we use in speaking, and I'll have more to say about this later. Um, so knowledge about which words can go before or after which other words and how to vary your voice when, spe uh, when speaking, all of these are parts of language along with the actual words that you find in a, something like a dictionary. Uh, so another definition that brings out more clearly clearly the connection with speech is that language, he says, is only a name for established habits of speech built up out of innumerable repeated acts of the same type. So this is all very much in line with Saussure so far, and also with Peckham, uh, Morse Peckham, who I've talked about a lot, who also distinguished culture from society in the same way. So culture is conventions or habits of behavior, while the actual manifesting of those behaviors produces what we call society. But let's go back to speech, which is more of our topic for today. We have our four factors of speech, which were what? Uh, speaker, listener, words, and things. Four of them. The meaning of speaker and listener, again, um, I don't think are too problematic. But there is an interesting point to be made here. So for Gardner, speech always involves more than one individual. I think he stated this, that you need more than one person involved. Uh, so for speech to take place, there needs to be another person present who the speaker wants to influence. Now, of course, you can always speak to yourself. Um, but I think a Gardner would consider this a form of thought, actually. We might, we might consider this a form of thought. So vocalized thought, and you're talking to yourself, it's kind of vocalized, but it's still thought nonetheless. So thinking is what one person does with language, although thinking can involve things other than language as well. Um, but speaking is what two or more people do with language, right? Okay, so we have our distinction bet uh, between speech and language, and I've suggested that words are part of a language. Now, what exactly are words? To understand words, I think we need to uh, begin with sentences. It's easier maybe to begin with sentences. Sentences are the units of speech, right? So words are going to be the units of language. Sentences are the units of speech. So when we speak, we speak in sentences. And sentences are made up of words, among other things. Uh, so in speech, we use words to make sentences, you might say. So uh, a sentence we could say is an intentional use of words, a use of words that has a certain intention. We have an intention behind it. So a sentence is a use of, of words so as to, quote unquote, uh, sorry, so a, a sentence is a use of words so as to, quote unquote, affect the listener in a particular way. Or as Gardner also says, a sentence is a, quote unquote, purposeful, purposeful performance of a speaker employing words to draw the attention of a listener to something. So we've got our four elements there, our speaker and uh, our speaker using words to draw the attention of a listener to something. We've got one, two, three, four. So thing, and, uh, by the way, thing has to be understood here in a very broad sense to include ideas and actions and attributes of objects and not just physical objects that we sometimes just think of as being things, but it's a much broader meaning of that. Basically, anything in the universe that you can think of could be a thing. So a sentence is used to draw the listener's attention to some action or idea or object or part of an object, etc., etc., etc. And a sentence for Gardner has to give satisfaction, as he says. It has to be satisfying. He means by this that we have to be able to get or grasp the purpose of the speaker. Uh, so for example, take the word, words strength by lifting. This is one of his examples. We've got three words, strength by lifting. So let's say we've overheard someone speaking this. The words uh, strength by lifting are not a sentence in Gardner's sense. Uh, these words don't seem to have a purpose, right? What's the purpose of saying that? They don't satisfy our need to identify a purpose. But the words could form part of the sentence, show, me, uh, show your strength by lifting this weight. Here we can identify a purpose. The speaker wants the listener to do something. So show your strength by lifting this weight is a sentence because it is a use of words for some purpose. Uh, I should mention that a sentence can be a single word as well. This is something he emphasizes a lot. So rain can be a sentence if I'm using the word to draw your attention to the fact that it started to rain. 
as Gardner says, um, it is function, not form, which makes a set of words into a sentence. So it's not having uh, certain kinds of words or a certain arrangement of words that makes something into a sentence, but having words used in an intentional way. And we can be more precise about the intentions behind a sentence. So recall that in the speaking situation, there are four factors, as I've said many times now, speaker, listener, words, and things. Uh, so the words used in speech, which form a sentence, can emphasize one of Three, the three other factors of speaker, listener, or things, right? So we can use words to direct attention to these different parts of the situation. So Gardner classifies sentences as exclamations, which draw attention to the speaker, uh, statements, which draw attention to things, and demands, uh, which include questions or requests, which draw attention to the listener and his or her knowledge or abilities. And Gardner notes that uh, his classification here is not really original. Uh, other scholars and even the standard grammar textbooks have made similar classifications among exclamations, statements, and demands. Uh, and it should also be noted that these classifications are classifications of emphasis. So a sentence is never exclusively, never purely one kind of thing or the other. So for, the, uh, for example, the sentence, it's a rainy day may mostly be a statement emphasizing the state of the world, emphasizing uh, things, but it's also a kind of exclamation drawing attention to the speaker. I'm saying this for some purpose. Um, I'm remarking on it. It was something that was noticeable to me. And it's also a kind of request for a response from the listener. I'm saying it because I want to have some effect on you, even if, if it's just to make you notice that I exist. Uh, so for Gardner, the sentence has a general sentence quality. So it's got general qual a general quality of being a sentence, of embodying some intention. And it's got a special sentence quality, a special sentence quality of being either an, or of emphasizing either an exclamation or statement or question or request. Um, so aside from the sentence's quality of embodying a particular kind of intention, sentences also have function and form. I've mentioned these words earlier, but you may not quite know what they refer to in this context. So the function is the intended effect on the listener. So uh, if you make a request, you intend that the listener help fulfill your request. Listeners then deduce the function from a combination of the sentence and the situation. So you've got these two factors and listeners are kind of trying to figure out what does the speaker want? Why is the speaker talking? Uh, okay, so we've learned that a unit of speech is a sentence which is made by a speaker with the intention of affecting the listener in some way. Now, a sentence is made up of two kinds of things, which Gardner calls locutional sentence form and elocutional sentence form. If you know your uh, Austin, this might sound familiar and also not entirely familiar. So locutional sentence form and elocutional sentence form. So this is pretty interesting, I think. So by elocutional sentence form, Gardner means mainly intonation. A sentence has a certain kind of melody that distinguishes it as a sentence. And different kinds of sentences, so again, exclamation statements, questions, requests, have different intonational and phrasing patterns. Uh, I think we sometimes call this prosody. One well-known example is the yes-no question, where intonation goes up at the end. So, do you want to have lunch with me? Right? Do you want to have lunch with me? Do you want to have lunch with me? There we go. Um, so, it has a certain uh, uh, melody to it, right? That makes you know that it's a question where you need to have some response as yes or no. Would you like to have lunch with me? So, you have this, uh, this ascending bit at the end, right? Lunch with me. But all sentences have some intonational pattern. It's how we know a sentence is happening. So elocutional form or intonation uh, seems to be mandatory. You can't have a sentence without elocutional form. When we read something, we add, I think I would say, we add elocutional form to it. And we've developed conventions such as punctuation to capture some aspects of elocutional form in writing, right? Words on paper don't uh, by themselves have elocutional form, but we give them a kind of elocutional form with punctuation, and then when we read them silently or out loud, we add the what would what we think is the appropriate elocutional form to them. 
Uh, it sometimes happens that we hear, so another example, we sometimes happen uh, to hear someone speaking in another room without being able to pick out any specific words. We just hear kind of a muffled sound. But we can tell from the elocutional form that they are uh, speaking sentences. And we can often guess whether they are doing something like making a joke or giving instructions or uh, asking questions, right? So this is be uh, because basic sentence sentenceness that's not a real word, but um, a basic quality of sentenceness is conveyed by melody, melody by its elocutional form. Uh, but sentences also have, or can have, locutional form. Locutional form seems to technically be optional, maybe kind of, this part gets a little confusing, unlike elocutional form. Locutional form is the words used, so it may sound odd to say that sentences don't need to have words. What does that mean? But think of sentences, at least Gardner would consider these to be sentences such as shh, uh-oh, or mmm, like tasty, mmm. Delicious. Uh, so if these are words, they are a very minimal sort of word, although you can usually find them in the dictionary, which is at least a clue to how we consider things to be. Uh, but if we want to, uh, uh, so one word, you can have uh, one word sentences, you can have sentences consisting of things that are barely words or kind of sort of not maybe words. Um, but if we want to affect our listener in a more complicated and complex way, we need to use more words. Gardner doesn't say a lot about word form in his writing. He was planning to write another book about words, but he never did. Um, yeah, so I'll leave that aside. But he seems to regard words as the minimal, meaningful unit of language, although we don't generally uh, separate words when we speak. Like if you're listening to me now, it's just a kind of a stream of sound with occasional breaks. Um, but it's usually pretty straight, uh, straightforward to figure out a language's words by asking people to speak slowly or, alter, or, you know, changing, altering parts of certain linguistic units to see if people still think they make sense and other kinds of experiments like that. There's lots of experiments you can do to see what do people consider to be words. Um, and of course, looking in a dictionary can be a help as well. Uh, in terms of how they work, Gardner has a basically Saussurian view of words. Saussure, uh, again, remember this uh, Swiss linguist, thought that a word was a sound image combined with a concept. Sound image and concept. So we have these two parts. Gardner calls this the outer and inner word form. So I'm not quite sure why he chose this outer and inner, why he chose outer and inner. It's a, uh, a little confusing to me once in a while. But also, he sometimes just calls these sound and meaning. So outer and inner word form or sound and meaning. So a word has a certain area of sound and a certain area of meaning. He talks about words having areas, areas of sound or areas of meaning. And there's a, so what that means is that there's a, a range of sounds that count as a word. And we kind of learn uh, the range of sounds that a word can have. Um, so there's a, a range of sounds that count as a word, and there's a range of things that the word can be used to pick out in the world, a range of things that the word means, right? When you look at it in a dictionary, for example, it's usually got definition one and two and three and four and so on. So words have a, a range of meaning as elements in language. So in terms of meaning, words are class names, we can say. Names for kinds of objects or actions or relations or events and so on. Things, broadly, as we've been using that word. So names for kinds of things. Uh, when we learn a word, we're learning uh, various ways we can use that sound to affect a listener with respect to some class of things which we've experienced. So Gardner calls words summaries of previous experience. They're based in the past. They're based on past experience, um, kind of your experience and perhaps the, uh, the experience of the society generally, the community of language users. Um, so the meaning of the word is all the ways we've known it to be used with reference to the things of the world. And when Gardner talks about things, he means not just objects, but actions and relations, etc. I've mentioned this already anything that can be perceived or conceptualized. So words on their own, um, can have a large and unstable area of meaning. Like if you just think about words, choose a word, any word, think about it. And, um, you know, it's hard to nail down exactly what it means. So think of a word like book. If I just say book, 
You'll probably think of uh, an object that has many pages bound together with words on them. That's kind of the common central meaning of book, maybe. But of course, book has several other meanings which come out in other contexts. So book a room, for example, or book it. We say, you know, go quickly, move quickly. <coughs> Sorry. So word meaning gets uh, narrowed down by context. So it has this broad area of meaning, which when it gets put into a context, it gets narrowed down. So including the context of the kind of sentence in which it appears, um, whether that's a demand or a request or an exclamation or whatever, a statement, whatever. As speakers, we use words as clues. This is an, an interesting uh, word that Gardner uses, is clues. We use words as clues to help the listener. Um, so when we're speakers, we use words as clues to help the listener know our intention. We're giving the listener clues. And as listeners, we use the uh, we use words as clues to figure out the speaker's intention, what the speaker wants from us. Um, Gardner compares a word to a unit of money, which we use to buy something less expensive, right? So, for example, um, say that a word is a hundred dollar bill. Uh, when you actually use it in a sentence in some actual situation, you might only get a dollar's worth out of it, right? So you it's got this broader meaning, this broader value. When you actually use it, you're just using a, a kind of a slice of that, a narrow slice of what the word of the word's more broad value meaning in this context, of course, but <laughs> value in terms of money. Uh, Gardner makes a distinction between meaning and thing meant, uh, which I think is applicable here. Um, so this, the, the distinction can be confusing for a variety of reasons. And he, uh, Gardner seems to suggest that words and sentences both have meanings and things meant. Uh, in a way, this is true. Maybe I, I'm still thinking about it, but it seems clearer to say that words have meanings and sentences have things meant. So for example, a dictionary gives an indication of the meaning of words, which is to say many of the ways in which they can be used. Um, but they only come to have a thing meant in the context of a sentence. So when I say, what a beautiful sunset, the word sunset, just to take the, uh, the kind of the most important word in the sentence, the word sunset, ha sunset has a meaning which is independent of the sentence. Uh, so its meaning is kind of beyond the sentence, above the sentence, before the sentence, I suppose, is a better way to say it, deriving from its history, the history of the word, which lets the word be used in various situations. But the thing meant, the thing meant by the word in the actual sentence is a, a specific thing here and now, an actual sunset. So when I say, what a beautiful sunset, the thing meant is my particular enjoyment of a particular sunset. So the meanings of the words is what allows me to put my feeling, my current experience into a form that can be understood by others, by other members of my language community. Well, let's take another example to see how words function as clues, right? I mentioned this idea that words are clues about the thing meant. So if, for example, we're sitting together and you suddenly say book, I'll be very unsure of what you're trying to convey to me. What is he talking about? What does he want? Uh, right, the word has a lot of potential meanings, but then you might say, bring me that book. Now, the functional meaning of book is getting narrowed down, okay? You're talking about a certain kind of object on which a certain kind of act should be performed. But perhaps there are several books in the room and I still can't quite get your intention. So you say, that book over there on the table. But again, I fumble around. So you say, um, the large red one with the gold words on the cover. So this example is a bit extreme, I know, but you can see how words function as clues to get me to see what you want. Uh, only you know exactly what you want, but if you want me to help you get it, you gotta use publicly available words to move my attention around until I can understand what you want. So that book lets me know that uh, what you want is an object nearby, but probably out of arm's reach. That book over there on the table directs my attention to a certain uh, location. And the large red book with gold words on the cover directs me to a particular object among all the other objects in that location, among other books maybe in that location. And then if there were other red books with gold letters, you'd have to provide me with even more clues. Maybe the second one from the right or something. 
Um, and since words are class names, as I've mentioned, when you say, bring me that book over there on the table, the big red one with the gold lettering on the cover, you're basically saying something like, bring me something that is over there, that is on the table, that is large, that is red, that is a book, that has letters on it, that are the color of gold. So by stringing all these categories together in a certain way, you hopefully get me to do what you want. So each word, Gardner says, each word is like a beam of light illuminating first this portion and then that portion of the field within which the thing, or rather the complex concatenation of things, signified by a sentence lies. Sometimes the direction of the beam remains constant, each successive word merely narrowing the area covered by its predecessors. Um, and this, con uh, this constant narrowing down is what mainly happens in my book example, where you get focusing in more and more on what uh, particular object you want me to get. But other times the sentence can pick out various features of a scene that need to be dealt with in, or observed in some way. So this is how the words of language, which are always general, always names of classes of things, come to have specific effects in the world. A person has an intention to ask a question or make a request or show surprise or anger or talk about a situation. And the person tries to come up with the arrangements of words and intonation patterns that will allow the listener to understand the thing meant, the thing that is intended by the speaker, right? Okay, well, there is a lot more that could be said about Gardner, but today I've mainly focused on the distinction between speech and language that he shares, shares with Saussure. I think Gardner would agree with Saussure that language is a kind of communal property while speech is an individual act making use of communal, communal property for social ends. Um, but whereas Saussure had a hard time saying exactly what the units of language or speech were, Gardner was more direct in saying that the units of language, uh, the unit of language is the word and the unit of speech is the sentence. And we saw that sentences come in various functional types exclamations, statements, demands, which include requests and questions. Uh, and these various functional types are expressed through elocutional form, which is the pattern of intonation, and often uh, locutional form, so a sequence of words. So words, for their part, are sounds associated with a more or less expansive area of meaning and sound, which gets narrowed down, well, at least the uh, the meaning. Well, of course, the sound gets narrowed down when you actually speak it, because you're using a particular sound, and the meaning gets narrowed down when words are applied in actual situations alongside other words. Okay, so that's all for today. All uh, I wanted to say about Gardner for now. Maybe I'll talk about him, about him again in the future, because he's written some other things that are quite interesting and relevant. But that's all for today, so thanks for listening, keep adventuring, and uh, until next time.